Yeah, I would like also to welcome you here in the department now on the new new focus. There were posters all over the university, new focus, which is a very, uh, I think, dynamic statement. And human makes nature is also maybe a very astonishing statement. But we uh, uh, started to rethink landscape in all possible difference and all perspective or starting that to do that and therefore we wouldn't like to address rather traditional maybe <laughs> like as a like this okay. uh, like uh, a discipline of painting or land art or something like that but we started to addressing us mankind was to have this opposite of nature culture and humans that was basically that one may follow the European okay Basically, one may follow the European Landscape Convention from 2000 and its definition. Landscape means an area and perceived, as perceived by people whose character is a result of the action and interaction of natural and uh, human factors. The convention tries to force up the awareness about landscape and its importance for society and to give him uh, its a lawful status. But the convention does not at all classify landscapes or, uh, as valuable or less valuable, as beautiful or ugly, good or bad landscapes. Landscapes are organized, perceived, adapted, polluted, prettified or pimped. Some of the most cultivated areas like Bali's rice terraces with its water temples and water management systems and canals are announced as the UNESCO World Heritage. The term landscape even spread out its meaning with echoes like natural landscape versus urban or city, uh, urban landscape or cityscape to seascape or soundscape. But in German, even politische Landschaft or Theaterlandschaft or Museumslandschaft is common for framing a structure of institutions, for example. English knows the verb to landscape. That's referring to a system of human-made spaces Land, in its Germanistic origin, denotes something free, of woods, for example, um, or of city authority, to which people belong. The suffix scape is related to the meaning to shape. So language indicates us that we know our shaping powers before anyone has written down economic concepts of it or of labor. But are we really aware of that? Someone like Hegel, for example, saw the complete sublation of nature into culture as humankind's destiny. But are we? Landscape right now is of all a hot topic because of the subject for the arts and all the reflection of all kinds of scientists. Since the Dutch Nobel Prize winning chemist and atmospheric researcher Paul Grudsen and the biologist Eugene Strömer suggested the Anthropocene as a name for the current geological age. It is a name for the dynamic interaction between natural and human forces, social and technological pro processes that rather than biological ones appear as driving forces on our planet. Society, culture and nature are so tightly intertwined that they can no longer be uh, independently investigated. It would appear that humans are overtaking the previous evolutionary tempo. We are very happy to welcome biologist and science journalist Christian Schwegel from Berlin, who will give later on a main introduction into this thesis of the Anthropocene, its ideas, its assumptions, its metaphors and discourses. And I think that he is nothing else but um, the most influential promoter of this idea in the German audience um, um, for now, because he uh, as I will introduce later on, initiated this uh, project, three-year-term project, three -term project at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt. Welcome, Christian. Landscape can no longer greenly be seen as beautiful, as they are far from idyllic sceneries and landscape has a long been largely artificial system. But now we are told through the thesis of Anthropocene that the whole status has changed uh, essentially. The planet, the ecosystem and us. That is the question of D 
deep time and an evolutionary timeline beyond geochemistry. Climate change, species extinction, pollution of air, water, soils, the transformation of Earth's surface through drilling, tunneling, mining, building, and all kinds of material, sediments, leftovers, a global phenomenon. We will hear tomorrow Heather, very welcome, and also from Pennsylvania State University about the tremendous effects of plastics uh, globally, a material known for its resistance of decomposition. Interestingly, plastic implies the more generic meaning of the word plasticity in regarding to the 3D shaping. Maybe that might be tomorrow a discussion. Welcome. And next to her is Matt Etheridge, archaeologist from the University of Leicester and a member of the Anthropocene Working Group of the International Union of Geological Sciences and the International Commission of Stratigraphy. So he is discussing if we will get an Anthropocene or not, if I understand right. Oh, that's it. Um, he will tell us more about his interpretation of landscapes as an archaeosphere as a mesh of human, unhuman, physical and material flows, especially of rivers. Maybe rivers and water are not the traditional landscapes also. In this archaeosphere, up to around 30 meters beneath the Earth's surface, we find remains of human activity over hundreds of centuries, where archaeologists used to dig for treasures, maybe ruins, prehistorical bones or cultural artifacts, they are now rethinking their discipline. Both Heather and Matt will talk about what sort of marker or trace we leave in the ground, for example, and what they implies, that implies. Melting glaciers and rising sea levels, storms or floods can be investigated and statistically documented, but how they are actually perceived and interpreted saying goodbye to the idea of a pristine, untouched nature, that is one thing, an utilitarian and anthropocentric attitude to, na to nature another, and a sense of oneself shaping our planet by using a car is yet a third difference. The reforming has reached such an extent that there is no longer a self-regulating Mother Earth on which we can rely. We should no longer be fearful for our survival in nature, but rather for nature itself. This is the core of the Anthropocene theory, we are told. According to Buckminster Fuller's expansionary modernist analysis of the spaceship Earth, we are still missing the instruction manual. What a pity. Especially for those would be helpful uh, who are saying that saving the planet is a matter of engineering particular geoengineering uh, for mastering uh, the whole planet. Often the Anthropocene has been reduced to an apocalyptic fantasy as a failure of the future, so to say, and the idea of progress. It's often um, said that it will be a continuous crisis and we would love to predict or handle this crisis. Many believe that there should be technologies as solutions. We shouldn't worry or need, don't need to worry about ending of fossil energies if we have synthetic biology. Soil additives will feed the whole world by increasing the crop yields. Some would maybe prefer like to label the Anthropocene therefore as Technocene. That would mean that humans are able to invent all needed techniques. Biological evolution would shift it into a technological evolution. But what is about the political ecologic? The more governments rely on technofixes, the more they depend on giant co corporations to manage our planet, and the less democratic our public policies and investments may be become. Who will take care if something fails? Blame the scientists. Gloria Meinen, welcome. Chair of Media Theory and Cultural History at the Zeppelin University in Friedrichshafen will examine now the black paradises of the Anthropocene and present a critique of calculability. 
central is a discussion of the concept of limit, its metaphors, narratives, and scenarios at, as the Anthropocene analyzes the world as a biosphere and therefore as a closed system. We do not have another, but something like too much people, too many consumption, too much pollution, something like that. Minen will present the attempt of British economist Thomas Malthus, published first in 1798, to calculate the limits of the world. His law saw the population doubling every 25 years, the growth in food production would be only linear. The limits to growth would be reached when the entire world was put under cultivation. In opposition to the white paradise of the Genesis, Malthus foresaw the emergence of a black paradise of crisis, of famine, of diseases. Minen will, I think, one, go one step further and question the ability of reducing the infinite reality of our ecosystem to the finite digital process. Um, to her person, Gloria Meinen studied German literature and philosophy in Cologne, Bonn, Bochum, Konstanz and Berlin and uh, completed her PhD in 2004 with Friedrich Kittler and Thomas Macho at the Department of Cultural Studies at the Humboldt University in Berlin. She then was a researcher and lecturer at the Helmholtz Center in Berlin at the University of Basel and in Zurich at the ETH and the College of Arts. And in December 2014, she founded, along with Bittenstetter and Katharina Tietze, the Office for Useful Fictions. Maybe she's telling us afterwards a little bit more about useful fictions. <laughs> 